Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today's call. We have a pretty big call today. I think we have about 800 people registered. So I'm going to give it just a minute or two to give people a chance to get on before we get started. Thanks everybody for joining today. I am gonna give it about a minute or two more. We have uh, over 800 people registered for today, pretty big call. So I just wanna give a little bit of time for uh, people to be able to join and then we'll get started. Thanks for your patience. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Diane Yantel. I'm president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Thanks so much for joining today's housed campaign call for universal, stable, affordable housing. We have a full agenda and a busy month ahead this February. Uh, members of Congress and the White House are continuing, not so much negotiations, more like discussions at this point on a scaled back, build back better act. And the $150 billion in housing investments that we've all worked so hard to get to this point remain at, at high risk. So as you all know, the Build Back Better Act as a whole is effectively dead after Senator Joe Manchin said in late December that he wouldn't vote for or further negotiate on it. But Democratic leadership in Congress and the White House are pretty eager to identify any pieces of the Build Back Better Act that can get 50 votes. They'll cobble those pieces together into a scaled back bill and they'll work to get it enacted as quickly as possible. So while the Build Back Better Act as a whole is dead, components of the bill aren't. And the Democrats are working pretty hard behind the scenes, under the radar, quietly, uh, to find a compromise scaled back bill in the next few weeks or months as soon as they can. So that scaled back bill, will pretty likely include climate investments, uh, maybe expanded pre-K, maybe some funding for expanded health benefits, um, but the expanded child tax credit and the housing investments are at risk. And you know, one of the really hard truths that makes this moment so challenging is of those two, and if forced to choose, many Democrats would prioritize the child's tax credit. So all of this leaves the $150 billion in housing investments really at very high risk of either being dramatically scaled back or cut altogether from a new bill. And there's been some talk of taking whatever components of Build Back Better that don't make it into a newly compromised bill and moving them forward as standalone legislation, but please understand that this is not a viable approach this year. A standalone, a standalone bill outside of reconciliation would require 10 Republican votes and additional floor time during a very limited election year schedule in the Senate. So a standalone housing bill of $150 billion for affordable housing would not be enacted this year or anytime soon. So, this is really another do or die moment for us. It's a moment for us to do all we can to ensure that key members of Congress continue to insist that these housing investments be included in a final reconciliation bill. We've been here before. We fought this same fight just back in October when housing investments were nearly dropped from a compromise Build Back Better Act before it passed the House. 
We fought then, we won, and now we need to do it again. We cannot, we will not allow these housing investments to stall or be left behind. Not now, not when homelessness is increasing, when rents are rising, when public housing is deteriorating, and when millions of the lowest income people are struggling just to keep a roof over their heads. Congress and President Biden have a once in a lifetime opportunity to address homelessness, to repair and preserve public housing, to put the country on a path towards universal housing assistance, and we can't allow them to miss it. Remember and remind your members of Congress what's at stake. The $150 billion in affordable housing in the Build Back Better Act includes $65 billion for public housing repair and preservation to make nearly 1 million affordable homes that house predominantly people of color to be decent, quality, accessible, affordable homes. It includes $25 billion in rental assistance for over 300,000 new housing choice vouchers. It includes $15 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund to build or preserve over 150,000 homes affordable to the lowest income people. Taken together, it would be the single largest investment in quality, affordable, accessible homes for the country's lowest income people in history. So we have come too far to give up now. It's not over yet. But to be clear, this final effort is our most challenging yet. So we really need you all to keep calling, keep tweeting, keep writing your members of Congress, urging them to protect the bill's historic affordable housing investments. Use our Legislative Action Center. Use our Build Back Better toolkit. Use all the resources, mobilize all the partners. The good news is that we continue to have tremendous congressional champions fighting with us to keep housing investments in the final bill. Chairwoman Waters, Chairman Brown, uh, Congressman Richie Torres, and one of the most steadfast champions, Representative Jayapal, the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, who will have on the call later today to discuss what she sees as the path to enactment. We've also had recent statements by several members of House leadership, uh, including Representative Clyburn and Representative Jeffries, just in recent days, talking about how essential these housing investments are and that they must be an ongoing priority. So your advocacy is working, so please keep going. And of course, in the end, it all comes down to Senators Manchin and Cinema. So NLIHC, we are at NLIHC, we're continuing to support our partners in West Virginia and in Arizona as they put up billboards, they take out radio ads and paper ads, reminding Senators Manchin and Cinema of the importance of housing investments in their states. So we'll talk about all of this more uh, throughout our call, but now I'm going to turn to our first speaker on our agenda, and I want to welcome back to the call Barbara DiPietro, who is going to talk about uh, a new resource from the Framework for an Equitable COVID-19 Homelessness Response. Barbara's from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and she's here to talk about some resources on medical respite care for people experiencing homelessness. So Barbara, thanks so much for joining. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Diane. Really appreciate being here. Uh, just want to, as Diane said, talk about a new resource that's available from the framework for the equitable COVID response for homelessness. I'm really excited about this because I think it gives a framework for a discussion that's often happening one by one by one in different communities. And I think this puts kind of a commonality to a lot of the tension points uh, that exist when we're trying to particularly combine healthcare approaches within a homeless services model. Uh, so if we can just plunge into the next slide. I think no one in this call will be surprised that one of the problems that we experience is that people experiencing homelessness have a lot of healthcare conditions that are very hard to manage if you're not in housing. Uh, and so traditional homelessness services providers like shelters will often see a lot of healthcare conditions coming in that they're just not equipped to, to, to handle. Uh, we don't expect our shelters to be providing medical care and shelter staff are often not medical care providers. Uh, but we do see a lot of hospital use, emergency department use, 911 calls. 
And frankly, at the end of the day, we can point to a number of our clients who were just not doing well. And so not only does this create a lot of problems for us as service providers, but also obviously is not serving people in the way that they need in order to get more stable and exit homelessness. So to this uh, text box here is, we're solving both a medical problem and a homelessness problem here when talking about medical respite care. Uh, next slide. And so when we talk about medical respite, for those who aren't familiar with this model, it's a post or po uh, acute or post-acute medical care for people who are homeless, who are coming out of the hospital, who aren't ill enough to continue to be in the hospital, but are too ill or frail to be on the street or in the shelter. And so for any of us who have stable housing, after a hospitalization, we're discharged home for rest and recuperation. But if you don't have a home, well, then where do you rest and recuperate? And so this is where medical respite comes in as a gap filling measure for being able to fill that space. So medical respite care in this box here, medical care and case management, providing either medical care on site or facilitating that off site with a lot of on site support services like case management, care coordination, uh, and making sure people have got a therapeutic environment that they can rest and recuperate. Uh, a lot of these are in shelters or standalone facilities, maybe hotel motel programs with a variety of staff and funding. But a lot of times these medical respite programs are coming to work in HUD funded programs. And so how do continuums of care and medical respite programs work together so that these are successful service models? Uh, next slide. And so what we did with this paper that we're uh, just recently released, we're trying to focus on this solution in concept. So the idea is that when someone's discharged from the hospital, they come to medical respite where they can get stability, they can get an ongoing care plan, and then are discharged directly into a permanent housing unit. Um, but as Diane talked about in the beginning, we need historic investments in housing in order to make these models work. A lot of our work is predicated on being able to get people into housing. So unfortunately, if we go to the next slide, the reality often is that we can't realize the concept is that, yes, we can do recuperation and stabilization in a medical respite care program, but without having a permanent home, we often are in the position of discharging clients directly to the street or to the um, shelter. And so we'd like this to be part of more of a model of stability. Uh, next slide, please. So the point of doing this, uh, this paper was to try to put a framework to the conversations that are happening in many of our communities right now. We pulled together listening sessions with continuum of care staff and listening sessions with medical respite care staff. And we ask them, what's working well with your relationships and what are the tension points? Where, where do you experience your frustrating pieces? And so what we discovered in a lot of, in, in looking at the feed, feedback is that everyone has shared desires. Everybody wants to see our clients get not only the healthcare they need, but get into the permanent housing that they need. Everyone wants to work together and the continuums of care did recognize the value of medical respite programs. However, what we did hear also is that there are mutual frustrations. So what are the emission criteria? Who is, who's your program taking and how many beds do you have? What does coordinated entry look like and how are we referring people into programs? Uh, what's the information that's being gathered in a medical um, context that could be helpful in our housing assessments to a demonstrate real vulnerability? And then frankly, we know we've got these bigger ongoing issues with gaps in housing and healthcare and who's ultimately responsible for homelessness, pitting medical respite programs and continuums of care into problems that they alone cannot solve. And so I'm gonna keep coming back to how Diane opened our, our conversation today with the investments that we need in housing. Housing is healthcare. And so bringing the healthcare lens into this conversation, if we can get those investments in housing, we're gonna see a tremendous ripple effect through the healthcare um, sector as well. Uh, so the paper has a lot more about the uh, details behind each of these five mutual frustration areas. But in the interest of time today, we're just gonna to go to the next slide and talk about equity, because really this was the, the, the project here was looking at a, an equitable response during COVID. And so we wanted to understand how could medical respite programs lend into more equity work? And so a lot of what medical respite does about getting people enrolled in benefits, getting them care coordinated, getting them in to see specialists, supporting them in, in, in the work that they need often can be anti-racist and it can be uh, uh, 
uh, improving uh, the disparities that we've seen. But what we found really is that a lot of folks are at the beginning of this work, that there hasn't really been yet baselines established and goals set that can be measured. And so we think about also, we've got these large homelessness services systems, medical respite programs are really small pieces a lot of times in that. So it's hard to also measure impact of a small program on a large issue. So this is something that people were very clear that we're gonna to continue to work on. But in the meantime, we'll move on to the next slide. And just to talk about how do we move forward? Uh, again, I'm going to come back to systemic changes are needed. Uh, medical respite programs, the homelessness services community can't fix homelessness on its own. We're working, all of us are working with a dearth of resources. And so how do we think about keeping our eye on this larger structural investment in housing and these larger policy changes that we need in healthcare in order to move us forward? So nobody is suggesting that medical respite programs and COCs are the ones to fix this. But if we move to the next slide, there are some things that we can do in the meantime. And so again, absent these bigger pieces, a lot of us are just figuring out how do we make it work uh, in the meantime. So the report also focuses on some action steps that COCs, medical respite programs, and frankly, their hospitals and their Medicaid or managed care partners can also be uh, partnering in. So understanding each other and helping build relationships. I think a lot of that is fundamental to our work. Figuring out how funding can be strategically used, given that nobody has enough of it. Uh, how do we clarify program referrals and coordinated entry participation and think about how do those systems work together? Where can we be adding or expanding with additional information? And then what information is really needed for decision making on housing vulnerability? So how can we maybe verify more healthcare information or how can we factor in more healthcare uh, uh, conditions in order when we're assessing how we allocate housing? Uh, how are we centering racial equity, measuring and value our, our, our progress toward that? And frankly, at the end of the day, using all of the partners we can to advocate to address the gaps in housing and healthcare. And this means bringing in insurance programs and, and hospitals, people who may have a lot of political capital to be able to raise the issue of why housing is so important to the healthcare um, conversations that are also happening. Um, next slide. And so part of this uh, report, we also wanted to do a spotlight on a community, uh, Yakima, Washington, which if you're not familiar with Yakima, they're in central Washington state. They've got a fantastic program going on. Uh, their, their medical respite program is part of their federally qualified health center, which can provide healthcare services offsite at the health center, but still has health center um, staff providing a lot of on-site support services in the medical respite program that is also part of their, their emergency shelter uh, program. And so working with coordinated care, working with the housing authority, working with the continuum of care, all of these folks are working well together to figure out how this works in a systemic way. So just again, as a spotlight to one community that's really got good success with this and the advice that they would offer to others. Um, next slide. And I think I just wanted to take a few minutes just to say thanks so much for this piece on medical respite care. We've got a lot of resources. If you're a community that wants to do more with your medical respite or bring up a new program, we'd love to talk with you. But also this report, which I'll drop the link in the chat here in a second, but this really looks to give a structure to the conversations that you need to have and figuring through some of these um, uh, common uh, tension points uh, that are surmountable, but not something that you have to go out alone. So with that, Diana, I'll turn it back to you to see if there's been any questions and just happy to be part of this discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thanks for being part of the conversation and for sharing and for putting together that um, this, this incredible resource. There was um, Judy Jackson is on the line and she put in a comment to say that when she was homeless, she became ill with pneumonia. And after being in the hospital for four days, she went back to a shelter and got to stay in bed for two days. And that was the respite that was available uh, to her. Um, and we had a question that came in uh, for you about how the work around medical respite care is so vital. Um, the question is, what do you see as some of the long-term solutions to increase medical care for people who are experiencing homelessness? 
increasing medical care in a broad sense. And so a lot of this is we've got other players in our communities. We've got skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes. And for those who have got really chronic and longstanding issues, we need the support of a broader range of our healthcare community. And so obviously we want people to be served in the least restrictive venue possible. But for folks that have got longer and more intense issues, those are more appropriate settings. But how are these players also stakeholders in housing, stakeholders in homelessness and part of that conversation? I'd like to see a lot more of our insurance plans, our hospital systems, and other people in the healthcare industry being active in the advocacy space so that we can argue for housing as healthcare. And so again, I'd love to see hospital systems demanding that Build Back Better Act include those housing investments that you talked about. So I think that's one piece. A second piece too, to be honest, we've got 12 states that have yet to expand Medicaid to low-income adults. And that's really a fundamental piece. And access to health insurance is literally life-saving for our population. And so any advocacy we can see to be getting greater access to those benefits uh, would be very helpful. That's great, Barbara. I couldn't agree more. And one more question I'll, I'll ask of you now comes from Jordan Everett, who asks if you have any research on healthcare systems, payers investing directly into housing in order to upstream healthcare costs. Um, and Jordan says, I know this has been done a bit in certain states. We're looking into making this argument here in Houston, Texas. We have the largest medical center in the country, but no systems investing directly in housing. I think there are a number of examples, actually, of systems that are investing in housing from the healthcare sector. Uh, I know of United Healthcare in particular has been doing some of this work. Uh, you're seeing this happen, but it does tend to be pilot programs. It tends to be smaller pieces rather than part of a larger structure. And again, I want to be careful, too, is that when we ask for healthcare systems to be paying for housing, Really, it's a lot of it is the healthcare system is trying to provide as much medical care as it can. And so how is it that other systems who have failed in our housing allocation, those are the ones that are held accountable for the housing so that you've got your healthcare system that can be delivering the care that it was really intended to do. And so I'm excited about hospital systems investing in housing. Certainly, this is something that more are doing. It's part of their community needs assessment and their charity, uh, their community benefit. Um, but we're also seeing hospital systems get more involved in medical respite programs as well, given that that's the direct discharge point for hospitals and the one that most uh, clearly and most immediately impacts their lengths of stay and their readmission rates. So it's interesting to see hospitals get involved in these social determinants of health in different innovative programs. But I would say I, I while I support hospitals doing this, I very much support Congress doing its job to do the allocations for housing that we need in a substantive way. There's no hospital intervention that's going to be able to replace that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Barbara. There's a few more questions that we won't have time to get to in as we're talking on today's call, but if you're able to stay on, I encourage you to look at both the Q&A and the chat box and engage with people there because there's a few other comments and questions. But thank you so much for joining Great. us today, Barbara. Thank you. Take care. I'm going to turn now to my colleague, uh, Nitu Nair from NLIHC, who recently um, uh, researched and wrote a report on emergency rental assistance among indigenous tribes. And she's going to share some of her findings today. So Nitu, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Diane. Uh, as part of the 25 billion included in the Treasury Emergency Rental Assistance Program, um, indigenous tribes and tribally designated housing entities received 800 million to provide assistance to low-income tribal members and residents of native lands. A total of 301 tribes and TDHEs qualified and applied for ERA-1 funds with grant amounts based off of their fiscal year 2020 Indian housing block grant formula. So each grantee received approximately 121% of their IHBG allocation. And by the end of September 2021, tribal grantees had obligated 278 million, approximately 35% of that total um, allocation for ERA-1. 
While some tribes and PDHEs have exhausted their initial ERA-1 grant and have received additional funds through the first round of reallocation, several grantees have not been able to successfully utilize ERA despite facing increased housing instability. Next slide, please. So our research examined the challenges and successes of tribal ERA programs. Unlike other state and local grantees, tribes and TDAGs serve households across multiple counties and even multiple states. They also potentially face housing needs and rental markets, infrastructure and ERA allocations that differ from non-tribal grantees, resulting in unique challenges and barriers to the ERA program. So this research used data from NLIHC's program tracking of um, 150 tribal ERA programs, as well as interviews with administrators of six tribal ERA programs. We identified and contacted potential interviewees based on two key factors, grantees with the highest and lowest total allocations and grantees who had ERA programs online at the time of interviews. Next, next slide, please. So findings from this research can be classified into four main categories. The first one being initial differences in income eligibility as defined by the IHBG program, which typically supports tribal housing programs and by the ERA program pose significant barriers for tribal grantees attempting to quickly set up and disperse ERA funds. Since several native lands cross multiple counties and even multiple state boundaries, IHBG typically allows grantees to use national median income limits or set income limits at the highest county limit. ERA, however, require these income limits to be set at local AMIs. Um, this posed a significant challenge in multiple ways. One, administrators had to determine and use income limits uh, for different applicants while some larger programs in the, uh, with the capacity and infrastructure to verify eligibility across several county boundaries had, could extend their coverage to members anywhere in the country, several smaller programs opted to restrict ERA coverage to fewer counties covered within their native lands to reduce that administrative burden of implementing this program. And this left several tribal households living outside of native lands to sort of find assistance from other local ERA programs. Secondly, fewer households were initially eligible for their ERA program as compared to other rental assistance programs offered by the IHPG program. This was primarily because local median income was often lower than the national median income limit. Many families often in crowded housing and facing housing instability did not qualify for ERA because their total household income exceeded the 80% local AMI threshold, whereas they would have qualified if it was the national medium income limit. In addition to these initial restrictions in coverage and eligibility, some administrators also expressed concern about their ability to utilize their full ERA allocation because their immediate area lacked a robust robust rental market, which also likely contributed to uneven spending across tribal grantees. So while Treasury issued guidance in late of August 2021, um, which modified the definition uh, of income limits for tribal ERA programs to match the definition under the IHBG program, uh, we heard that several administrators found that reviewing previously denied applications just added to the administrative burden for for the program. Next slide, please. We also heard uniformly that having the necessary infrastructure to run a program of this magnitude was crucial for overall success. While programs with sizable ERA-1 allocations were able to utilize the 10% administrative capacity cap to build up infrastructure, smaller programs couldn't afford to cover the costs associated with increasing the capacity. Over half of all tribal grantees received grants of less than 1.5 million, resulting in less than 150,000 for administrative costs. Administrators had to then rely on existing infrastructure to disperse ERA funds. And as a result, uh, several programs resorted to running offline programs um, with limited staff running ERA in addition to existing programs. Next slide, please. 
So in understanding initial restrictions of ERA funds and the administrative challenges in implementing these programs, strategies like the use of documentation flexibilities and um, the use of non-traditional applications became even more crucial in serving as many low-income renter households as possible. Programs that use self-attestations to document financial hardship related to COVID or to document income were able to disperse ERA funds more efficiently. Administrators also benefited from using fact-specific proxies or categorical eligibility, which reduced the need for additional documentation. Given um, broadband coverage limits and challenges with technological literacy among applications as well, um, a common program strategy was to provide accessible and constant support through call centers, as well as the use of innovative phone-based applications. In fact, we heard staff would record conversations, complete applications over the phone, read self-attestation forms out loud, and accept verbal agreements via electronic voice signatures, as well ways to offer um, more renter households the options to apply for ERA programs. Next slide, please. And finally, we found that more timely communication and resource sharing like template applications and ERA policy samples between treasury and tribal grantees would have helped administrators, specifically those of smaller programs, quickly set up and disperse funds without additional administrative burdens. Treasury has since published resources has, as part of their prom promising practices for ERA programs. However, administrators said that they would most benefit from examples specific to tribal grantees, such as best practices on reaching rural households or strategies for addressing local challenges like overcrowding using ERA funds. Moving into reallocation, grantees caution that the need for additional ERA funds might not always be demonstrated by current spending patterns alone. Several programs indicated a need for additional funds to cover the administrative expenses, even while they had not really met the spending threshold to request more funds. This was primarily because that initial 10% cap on administrative costs left several grantees with insufficient resources to actually implement a program of the scale. One, uh, so one interviewee, in fact, explained that additional ERA funds would actually give them adequate resources needed to spend down their full ERA allocation and distribute the remaining assistance. Administrators suggested that Treasury should modify the way grantees de could demonstrate additional need and expand the methods used to determine who could request additional funds as well. Uh, next slide, please. So our research showed that smaller rental markets, infrastructure limitations, staff capacity, and in many cases, limited administrative funds presented unique challenges for tribes and PDHEs implementing ERA programs. But despite these significant challenges, several tribes and PDHEs adopted best practices like the use of documentation flexibilities and employed strategic partnerships to sort of minimize the administrative burden and better serve as many low-income renter households possible. So if uh, the full report is available at this link and I'll drop it in the chat as well, um, but if you have any further questions, feel free to email me uh, at nnair at nlic.org and I'm happy to answer any questions here and offline as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Me Too. I really appreciate you, um, the work that you did on this and sharing it on today's call. There is one or two questions, but I'm going to come back to it later because our next speaker is joined. Um, so, Me Too, I'll come back to you a little bit later with some uh, one or two questions for you. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm I'm really pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, which is Congresswoman Jayapal. Uh, Representative Jayapal is serving her third term in Congress, representing the 7th District of Washington State. She is the first South Asian American woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. As chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, she has been instrumental in ensuring that historic housing resources are included in the Build Back Better Act, including the House campaign's top priorities for rental assistance, public housing, and the Housing Trust Fund. And after getting these priorities through the House, she is now fighting and continuing to lead efforts to see them through 
to enactment. And it's for her leadership that we are thrilled to be honoring her and the entire Congressional Progressive Caucus at our annual Leadership Award celebration this spring. So Representative Jayapal, thank you so much for your leadership and for joining us today. We're so glad to have you back on our national call. Welcome. Diane, thank you so much to you and the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We simply could not have gotten this far without all of you, uh, all the movement advocates that have the smarts and the push to be able to help us do something truly transformational. And so I know that we're not all the way to the end yet. Um, and I know we're gonna talk about that today, but I did just wanna say thank you so much. And of course, uh, I and the Progressive Caucus are humbled and honored to receive the award from you all. It really is this coalition that deserves the award for um, just your brilliant work and your partnership with us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. And you know, you have been, Congressman Jayapal, you've just been such an incredible champion for these critical housing investments to address homelessness, to repair public housing, to put the country on a path towards universal housing assistance. So can you talk, can you tell us uh, why you see these investments as central to the progressive agenda? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, I obviously uh, represent Seattle, the seventh congressional district. And here in Seattle, I have watched as um, the housing crisis has hit us very, very hard in a city that is one of the wealthiest in the country. Um, and yet we see increasing numbers of uh, people who need housing assistance, who can't afford housing, who are on the streets and unable to get that housing first, um, which is necessary for so much else. And so this has been a passion of mine for actually a long time. I've worked with a number of our housing partners here, whether it was around um, creating uh, more supportive long-term housing for people who have a number of different vulnerabilities. Um, right here in my neighborhood, actually, it was one of the activist things I was doing almost 20 years ago, um, to now as a member of Congress, where I feel like this is the critical piece that is at the center of so much else. That is why we endorse a housing first model, because we're facing crises from so many multiple levels with COVID, with climate, with evictions. And our response in this moment could really make a world of difference in whether people economically prosper. And I think the advocates on this call know too well that families are just too close to missing their rent or their housing payment, and that that defines so much else of what is possible for a family or an individual. And um, I think that's why we put a lot of emphasis, Diane, on emergency rental assistance. It is a lifeline. But we also know that rental arrears are not the cause, but a symptom of a much larger problem in so many of our communities. And that's, um, for me, as we think about what we advocated for together in Build Back Better and how the Progressive Caucus with uh, Chairwoman Maxine Waters, of course, and her leadership, one of the co-founders of the Progressive Caucus 20 years ago, the reason we advocated for housing in every meeting, whether it came up or not, we brought it up and we made sure it was a part of the package is because if we can keep our families stably housed, then it means that we can look at so many of the other holistic pieces um, that a family or an individual needs. And, and looking at the housing crisis holistically is the thing that we really need to do. So um, that is, that's why I'm, I'm uh, passionate about this and it's why I've introduced my housing as a human right act um, with your support and your guidance and your input, uh, because I really believe that it's about how we look, look at this. The housing is not something that comes later. Housing has to be there at the very beginning. And then we can build an array of supportive services around that, but treating people with dignity um, and respect in that process is absolutely critical. Absolutely. And so speaking of Build Back Better, <laughs> uh, you know, it was so discouraging uh, to all of us to have the bill as a whole effectively killed last year when Senator Manchin announced that he wouldn't vote for it. Um, but I, like you, still really believe that a deal is possible, if not likely. Um, there have been a lot of recent news reports and intel that indicate that the housing investments 
aren't on the short list of things that Senator Manchin would support in a scaled back bill. But um, I think it was just last week you said differently. You said that Senator Manchin told you directly that he does and he would support the housing investments. So this is very good news uh, and really heartening for everybody to hear. So can you tell us more about what you think Senator Manchin could agree to in terms of affordable housing in a new, newly negotiated bill and what you think is the path forward to enactment? Yes. Well, Diane, first, I just have to say, you know, many of us are activists and have been activists for a long time. Many of the people on the call are. And we understand that the things we're working on are hard. If they were easy, they would have been done. And they're not done because they're hard. I mean, we are looking at something truly transformative here, the biggest federal investment in housing in the history of our country, $150 billion that uh, would make such an enormous difference to our community. And so I think we have to keep that in mind. Um, we have to recognize that not everybody sees things the way we do, and yet we were successful in getting it into the bill that passed the House. And I can't speak for Senator Manchin today. I want to make that very clear. But in all of the conversations I had with him, going back to my very first conversation with him months and months ago, as well as the conversation I had with him after uh, he went on Fox News um, in, in, Jan in December, we have spoken about the housing investment as something that he does support. I think he does um, understand why it's necessary for us to make these investments in, um, in our housing stock, in our public housing repairs, in all of the different pieces of, of what we have in Build Back Better. Now, I think at the same time, we are running up against time and we are running up against an overall amount that um, the Senator has been clear he doesn't wanna go up against. And so that is the push now is to figure out exactly what this looks like. But don't forget that on October 28th, the president rolled out a framework to us that included 150 billion in housing, included universal childcare, included universal pre-K, included half a trillion dollars for climate. Um, all of that had his included healthcare subsidies as well as um, an agreement on some uh, serious um, progress on prescription drug pricing. All of that was signed off on by both Senators Manchin and Cinema. And so my hope now is that we can quickly move to um, the pieces that have that agreement, that have stayed as part of the agreement that we reached. The Progressive Caucus endorsed that framework. Um, and so that is, I believe, the closest that we are going to come. Um, but look, I'm willing to, we've been, we passed much more than that in the House bill. And to be fair to Senator Manchin, we passed things that he did not agree to. And, um, and so I, I believe we can now go, you know, sit down with him and say, you already agreed to these transformational things. Imagine, Diane, what that would be like if we got universal pre-K, universal child care, housing, elder care, um, and climate change, uh, as well as hopefully the extension of the CTC for a year, which he also had agreed to, only one year, but he had agreed to that to give us some time to think about how to address that issue. So that is my hope, is that we can proceed quickly. And I think it's important for all of us, as you may have seen, the Progressive Caucus put out a statement last week saying that we think this needs to be done by March 1st. We've gotten some pushback around that, but I don't know what's gonna change in a month. Nothing's gonna be different in a month. We have everything we need to get this done. Let's get it done and let's get out there and get relief to people so that we can start um, really making a difference in people's lives and how they see their opportunities and their livelihoods. Yeah, and I guess, and I mean, just to say too, that of course, the it was the work of the Congressional Progressive Caucus in large part, that's why these transformational housing investments were included in that framework. It's because the CPC had it in its framework uh, long before that. That's so right. So thanks again, and credit to the CPC we, for we pushing it We put it up in the way. very beginning, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it was not easy. As you know, we're progressives. We want everything, but yeah. we, prioritized, we prioritized five key areas, and um, housing was one of them. We were very clear from yeah. the very beginning, going back to January or February, that that was a priority area for us, and we have continued to push, and we will continue to push for it. 
Yeah, and so, so you know, in that way, of course, the Congressional Progressive Caucus um, and the House already did its part. You already did your part. You, you negotiated, you agreed to this framework, um, you got these transformational housing investments included in it, it got passed through the House, um, only to see it now kind of stall out in the Senate. So uh, we did see last week the, the new pressure that the CPC is putting on um, leadership to, to move this forward. And I think that's really helpful to have that, that new deadline, that new pressure. But what other, in what other ways is the Progressive Caucus um, acting now to keep this legislation moving forward? Well, we are trying to do everything we can on every level, private conversations, public conversations, public pressure. And I think what's important is for our movement to echo that. And so weighing in specifically with the White House, because I do believe, Diane, that it is the president who's going to be able to make this happen if it's going to happen, because he was the one that negotiated the deal with Senator Manchin. And I think he is the one that can bring him back to the table. And so um, I do think continuing to keep the drumbeat high and for people who say, well, March 1st is too soon or we can't do it by then, just ask them what is going to change between now and March 1st? What will we know beyond March 1st that we don't already know? We already know what Senator Manchin supports. We already know what can get 50 votes in the Senate, what can get 218 votes in the House. We already know what the White House supports. We already have text, thanks, as you said, to the Progressive Caucus refusing to pass the infrastructure bill multiple times until we had transformed, until we had negotiated a framework, transformed it into legislative text and passed it through the House. Um, so I think we have all the tools we need. This is the final negotiation. And I think that we have to keep up the pressure and we could use your help in keeping up the pressure to pass this quickly, because I do not think time is our friend. There are many other things on the Senate's uh, desk, including a very important Supreme Court nomination, that all of that is going to take the attention very soon. So I feel like we have a very short window and anything you all can do to encourage the White House encourage the Senate. And I've been in conversations with a number of senators who feel the same way, who said to me, Pramila, don't stop, keep pushing. Um, March 1st is the right deadline. In fact, a couple of senators said to me, we should really be able to get to an agreement in the next week. Um, there's nothing new here. We should be able to do that, but it is going to take leadership. And I think that's what we need at this point. So on that, and from your, from your, you know, you have a really unique perspective, having been really active in your community before you were a member of Congress and now being a U.S. representative and the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, what advice do you have for us as advocates and organizers and impacted people that are on the line and beyond in terms of what are the most effective things we can do right now to yeah. keep the pressure up, as you say, because we certainly want to, we agree that we have to get this done and we have to get it done now. Yeah. So what more can we do and what's most effective that we do? Well, just before we get to Build Back Better and what we can do to pass that, I just want to say, and I caught the tail end of the conversation before, one of the things I just want to say to all of you is your voice is really needed in your own states, counties, towns, and cities in terms of getting em the emergency rental dollars that we did approve into people's hands into every single hand that needs it and letting people know that that came about because of the American Rescue Plan, because of the work of a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president. There are hundreds of millions of dollars, in my mind, unfortunately, still out there that have not found their, their way to the people who need it. Just in the state of Washington, as an example, we still have $187 million of first round assistance that is out there. And I know um, that the, because I've, I've actually sat in on some of the application, um, you know, places where people are helping people to apply. The application process is a barrier. We really tried to simplify it, but you know, anything you all can do to reach out to people and make sure that the money we did put out there actually gets uh, out to people would be huge. And of course, continuing to speak up for people who are experiencing homelessness and hopefully you all are helping to get your member of Congress on my Housing as a Human Rights Act, um, which invests 300 billion into housing infrastructure to humanely house people experiencing homelessness um, and many other things. But in terms of Build Back Better, Diane, I think it's what I said. It's, 
you know, if you can do, if you can highlight stories of how this rental assist, uh, how this uh, housing assistance is going to make a difference to real people, virtual town halls, bring your member of Congress, including your senator, make sure you're talking to your senator and saying, push for this to be done in the next four weeks. We need the urgency from the Senate and we need the urgency from the White House. So I think um, you may have seen there was a letter. In fact, maybe I didn't look at the full list. Maybe you all were on there from nonprofits and others to the White House, to the president, urging him to get this done quickly before the State of the Union. That is the kind of pressure that we need to see and um, that we need your senators in particular to feel, um, you know, to be able to move this forward quickly. So we have a, a relatively short window of time here uh, before I think we, we lose even more momentum and we can't afford that. So pump up the volume, your letters, your calls, your, your virtual town halls, your storytelling. Those are the things that are going to move the needle um, right now. Well, we will. We will. And thank you. And you too. Please keep fighting. We've got your back. We're behind you all the way. I hope you can get a chance or your staff can get a chance to look through the chat and the Q&A. There's so many people saying thanks to you, lots of your constituents that are on the line as well. Um, and I want to echo and just say again how grateful we are for your leadership and your support and all of the work that you've done to get us this far. When we are successful in getting Build Back Better enacted, there'll be so much more to do. And so much of it is included in your Housing as a Human Rights Bill. So we look forward to continue partnership and continue to, continuing to work with you until we end homelessness and end housing poverty once and for all in our country. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you to everybody on this call for everything you do. I am so proud to be in this fight with you and I will not stop fighting. If you know me, you know that is true. So here we go. I believe it. Let's get it across <laughs> the finish line. Thank you so much. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. How wonderful to have Congresswoman Jayapal join us again uh, to share all her wisdom and insights. And I do believe with champions like her continuing to fight this fight that we will win and we will be successful. So I am going to come back um, briefly to Neetu Nair, my colleague at NLHC, who um, was sharing her report on ERA um, uh, among indigenous tribes. Hi Neetu, thank you. There is one question that I'm gonna ask of you. Um, let me just see if I can find it. Oh yeah. So um, Sylvia Werba was asking about how you chose the tribes that were interviewed and highlighted in the report. She notes that some of the tribes that we contacted are some of the biggest tribes in the US. And uh, were there any discussions about reaching out to mid-sized or smaller tribes given how unique their experiences can be? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's a really great, great question. Um, yeah, our sample did include some of the larger tribal grantees. So in order to gain the perspective of um, some of the smaller tribal grantees and to also just make sure that our findings were in line with our tribal grantees consent. Uh, across the board, we we consulted with the National American Indian Housing Council um, to ensure and to also gain the perspectives of um, and specific challenges of running ERA with like smaller tribal grantees. So our findings did include challenges, experience specifically challenges related to limited administrative capacity uh, that was specifically felt by administrators running smaller ERA grants. Um, we, we heard things like the lack of timely communication and shared resources ended up affecting smaller grantees a little bit more than they affected some of the larger grantees because some of those shared resources could have offset some of the administrative burden associated with running the ERA program. So we we made uh, we made sure to include all of those findings into this report because, as Sylvia mentioned, the the experiences of some of the smaller grantees vary very differently from some of the larger ones. Great, thanks very much, Nitu, and thanks again. Thanks for your patience to come back, and thanks for coming back on. Of course, and thanks for your good work on this report. Thanks, Anne. All right, I'm gonna to turn to our next speaker who is also a colleague at NLIHC, Jade Vasquez. 
um, who put uh, together a report and a website and a database on new tenant protections um, during, tied in some ways to emergency rental assistance, but new tenant protections during the pandemic. So Jade, I'll turn it over to you to share. Thanks, Diane. Hi, everyone. Uh, so today, NLIC launched a new web page titled the Tenant Protections Resource Page. Uh, the webpage offers resources and tools to help researchers, policymakers, housing advocates, and tenants better understand the types of protections recently enacted and inform advocacy efforts to increase local, state, and federal protections moving forward. Uh, this includes our recent tenant protections policy report, the state and local tenant protections maps, a tenant protections dashboard that summarizes the types of protections passed, and an interactive searchable database. Next slide, please. Last week, I joined the national call to discuss our findings in the policy report titled Tenant Protections and Emergency Rental Assistance During and Beyond the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, the report provides a descriptive analysis of laws and policies related to tenant protections and emergency rental assistance uh, that have been enacted or implemented by states and local governments in 2021 as well as NLIHC's recommendations to strengthen protections at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, the public health emergency and resulting historic aid to renters have fundamentally shifted the housing landscape in the United States. In addition to the federal moratorium and availability of emergency rental assistance, state and local jurisdictions across the country have recognized the critical role tenant protections play in preventing evictions and ensuring housing stability for the lowest income and most marginalized households. 30 states and 59 localities passed or implemented more than 130 new laws or policies to protect tenants from eviction in 2021. Six executive orders and 16 court orders were signed, 78 state and local laws were passed, and 33 ERA programs enacted policies that provided additional protections to tenants. Next slide, please. So the types of tenant protections included in this resource are state and local eviction moratoriums, pauses on the eviction process to allow for ERA processing, mandates to increase information about ERA and limit tenant fees, increases to tenant representation during the eviction process, such as right to counsel and increasing government funding for legal aid, and protections that reduce discrimination and promote housing stability, such as source of income discrimination laws and sealed or expunged eviction records legislation. Next slide, please. And so to accompany the report, NLIC's research team also developed two interactive maps that demonstrate which states and localities enacted or implemented tenant protections uh, since January 2021. Next slide, please. And in addition to listing the types of tenant protections in each state, the state tenant protections map also includes the number of renter households in each state, the number and percentage of renters behind on rent in each state, and the percentage of low income or cost burden households served by the ERA program within the state. Next slide, please. So the tenant protections report and the maps derive from uh, ERASIS state and local tenant protections database, which is a resource of tenant protections that have been passed since January, 2021. The database includes policies, legislation, ordinances, executive orders and court orders that cities, counties and states across the country have enacted to protect marginalized renters and prevent a wave of evictions that could be catastrophic during a global pandemic. Each tenant protection includes a state, jurisdiction, bill of ordinance number, a short description of the law or policy, and a link to the legal text. NLIC will regularly update the array state and local tenant protections database as we learn about the passage of new laws and policies in 2022. So if you know of any recent legislation passed in your city, county, or state, please share with the ERA team by contacting me at jvasquez at nlic.org. Next slide, please. And to make the information provided in the database more user-friendly, our team at NLIC added some new features to the research page, including a tenant protections dashboard, which summarizes the protections passed by jurisdiction, the type of authority used to implement them, uh, whether it's an executive order, court order, ERA program or legislation, and the nature of the protections, such as fiction moratorium, right to counsel, or a source of income discrimination law. Next slide, please. And then the other tenant protections um, uh, resource is the uh, searchable tool uh, that allows you to sort tenant protections in various categories. 
including the state and local jurisdiction, the implementing authority, the type of tenant protection. And so I wrote an example here. Um, so in the photo, you can see that I typed in Connecticut uh, in the search tool. So I would be able to see all of the tenant protections passed in the state beginning January, 2021. And then I was able to further filter uh, to see um, what, how, if, if there was any sort of right to counsel legislation, which there was. Um, so you can see that I filtered it by legislation and then also by category. Uh, yeah, so next slide, please. And so our goal with the tenant protections resource page is to demonstrate how states and localities are using their power to advance housing as a human right while encouraging the federal government to scale up these tenant protections by passing national legislation. Uh, emergency rental assistance and the short-term protections tied to it will eventually expire, but the long-term tenant protections like source of income discrimination laws, right to counsel, shield eviction legislation, and good cause eviction legislation will outlast the pandemic. Uh, we hope that the tenant protection resources provided can serve as a guide to housing advocates and policymakers looking to pass similar protections in their own jurisdictions, as well as inform struggling tenants living in these jurisdictions of their rights. Uh, we believe that this whole of government approach is crucial to meaningfully addressing our nation's housing affordability, affordability crisis, prevent evictions, and end homelessness one, once and for all. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Jade. We don't have any specific questions, but we do have a few um, people putting in the chat box how much they appreciate this resource and how helpful it is. And I would agree. So great work, uh, Jade, and to everybody on, on the ERASE team at NLIHC. And I want to underscore um, and reiterate what Jade said, which is that we can make this as useful as possible if you all let us know what's missing. So do reach out to Jade. She'd love to hear from you if there's anything missing from here or that can be added. Um, thanks very much, Jade. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna turn now to field updates and I'll start with Kendra Knighton, who is a policy associate at Idaho Asset Building Network. Um, Kendra, thanks for joining, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Diane. I'm very happy to be able to join you all to give you an update today. Um, so like Diane said, my name is Kendra Knighton and I work with the Idaho Asset Building Network. Uh, we are a policy advocacy organization based out of Boise, Idaho and advocating for affordable homes is one of our uh, primary focuses. So our legislative session here in Idaho started in the beginning of January and we knew going into this session that housing was going to be quite the hot topic. And for the most part, we have seen that be pretty true already. Um, so leading into the legislative session, we um, scheduled our very first uh, virtual, or sorry, our very first housing advocacy day at the Capitol. And that is an event that we hosted last Monday. Um, due to, you know, just wanting to make sure that folks were comfortable in participating, we did decide to do a hybrid event. And overall, it was a pretty successful event. Uh, we did have a few people who chose to participate in person and they were able to meet with over a dozen lawmakers throughout the day. And we had about 100 people participate virtually. And overall, we had over 500 emails that were sent to lawmakers using our action tools. Um, so we were very excited for that event to be as successful as it was and you know, able to kind of stay ahead of the messaging on housing and educating our lawmakers on the issues related to it. Uh, so we have a pretty robust policy priorities uh, list this year. Um, like many of you, one of our main priorities is ensuring that the second round of emergency rental assistance is approved by our legislature. Uh, last year, we did quite a bit of work to ensure that that first round was approved, and it was a pretty difficult process, to be honest. Uh, we had to do quite a bit of education with our lawmakers and talk to them quite a bit about how much rental assistance was needed and how much good it could do in our communities, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so this year, we are you know, hoping that the education that we did last year, as well as the significant benefits that we've seen from our emergency rental assistance program will be recognized by our lawmakers and that the approval of the second round will go much smoother. Um, another policy priority that we are very excited for this year is the governor's proposal to commit $50 million of the state's fiscal recovery funds to the development of affordable homes. Um, so this is not only a significant amount of funding for housing in Idaho, it's a historic amount of funding. 
Um, Idaho is one of the few states that has not dedicated any funds to our state housing trust fund. And for the most part, the state has relied on federal and local programs to address housing issues. So this proposal coming from the governor's office is something that we are very excited about and we are very grateful for him for doing that. Um, and we are now working with his office quite a bit to ensure that whatever program they design to administer these funds uh, benefits renters with the lowest incomes um, and includes the voices of impacted Idahoans and um, marginalized communities. Um, another very exciting bill that we've already seen come up was, rep er, was introduced by Senator Melissa Wintrow and has bipartisan support from both chambers. And this uh, phenomenal bill would enable homeowners and tenants to voluntarily update housing covenants that include racially restrictive language. Uh, so I know many of you know about the um, legacy of racism and or discrimination in housing. And this would be a significant step in Idaho to remove that language from deeds and covenants and just remove that from properties as they're being transferred. Um, we also have several bills that are quite harmful that would also start to hurt some of the few renter protections that we do have in Idaho a uh, step backward. Um, so we are working quite a bit to oppose those. And again, reach out to our lawmakers and educate them about the need for stable housing and uh, effective renter protections. Uh, so with that, I would just like to say thank you again for including us in this call and I'll pass it back to you, Diane. Thanks, Kendra, and congratulations on your successful event and your successful advocacy. Um, I had a question and then there's actually kind of a follow-up question that just came in via the chat box, but the $2 million um, that is going towards affordable housing in Idaho, did you say, is that from the state's um, state and local fiscal relief money from the American Rescue Plan? Sorry, I'm afraid I might have misspoke. Um, it's $50 million, 50, and it would be from the state fiscal recovery funds from the American Rescue Plan Act. That's great. And then Gail Tillman is asking, how much housing does that translate into in Idaho? Uh, so that's a difficult question to answer at the moment uh, because the governor's office is still coming up with exactly how these funds would be administered. Um, and what types of projects they would fund. So once we know a little bit more about the specific programs and way that they plan on distributing the funds, we'll be able to get a better sense of how, how much housing that will actually um, be able to provide. Great. Well, congratulations again on your successful advocacy and thanks for sharing it on today's call. Thanks, Diane. Take care. All right, I'll turn now to our next field update, which comes from Los Angeles. Jonathan Jaeger, or Jaeger, you can correct me, is staff attorney at Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Diane. Um, and we can go to the next slide or two. Um, I'm here to talk today about what um, is going on in Los Angeles. As I think someone mentioned in the chat, there was a, a pretty significant vote last week to uh, extend our protections here in LA County. Um, and I'll start by just giving you a, a timeline and a little bit of background on what's been going on for the past two years. Um, the County of Los, Ange County of Los Angeles first um, declared a state of emergency due to COVID-19 on March 4th, 2020. And you know, within two weeks of that issued their first uh, emergency or executive order um, banning evictions for non-payment of rent and other reasons through May 31st, 2020. Um, a month later, they expanded this to also apply to incorporated cities that were not passing their own local protections. Um, and then as of September, they expanded this to create a baseline of protections everywhere throughout the county. Uh, the county of Los Angeles um, is massive. It's the, the largest county by land area in the country, and it consists of 88 different incorporated cities that all have their own local city governments. Um, as well as a very large um, swath of unincorporated areas. Um, our Board of Supervisors for, the, for most local government um, activities only has legislative authority over those unincorporated areas, um, but they decided to use their uh, expanded authority under the California Emergency Services Act, so long as there's a state of emergency in place to start legislating in these incorporated cities. Um, the 
these protections were being extended monthly. Um, every month they would reconsider an extension of the emergency protections and occasionally modify them slightly, um, sometimes adding more protections based on you know, what um, tenants and advocates were reporting from the field and sometimes removing protections based on what the um, landlord and property owner um, lobbyist groups were informing the supervisors about. Um, these monthly extensions were obviously very problematic because every month tenants were unsure if they were going to continue to have protections the next month. Oh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the other important bit of context here is that in September 2020, uh, the California legislature passed a bill that has been extended and modified a few times um, that controls the protections for tenants who have been unable to pay rent and the repayment of that arrears. Um, they really left um, authority for cities to regulate other grounds for eviction, but until April 1st, 2022, cities cannot legislate, um, pass new legislation or new orders around the non-payment of rent. Um, currently in California, we don't have any deferral of unpaid rent at, since about October of 2021, um, but we do currently have a um, state law that delays eviction lawsuits if there is a pending application for emergency rental assistance. Next slide, please. Um, so the vote that happened last week um, is the, the culmination of a long process um, that was kicked off in late 2021. Um, a board of supervisors requested a report on how to wind down these protections, um, seeing that you know, in October, November 2021, our COVID numbers were going down and they wanted to, they, they recognized that they couldn't simply eliminate everything in one day and they wanted to understand what the best way to um, slowly ramp down the protections were. Um, they were set to expire today. Um, then the board, um, the departments came back uh, with a three phase plan, um, phase one through the end of May. Um, phase two through the end of this year, and phase three um, through the halfway through next year. Um, the board adopted last week phases one and two of this three-phase plan. Um, I also want to give credit to the advocacy around this was mostly done by a coalition called Keep LA Housed, uh, which grew out of a larger coalition called Healthy LA, um, and it's made up primarily of tenant advocates, um, legal service providers, community-based organizations, um, that have done a lot of work coalesced around providing tenant protections and understanding the, um, the impacts that unpaid rent are going to have on tenants. Um, in November 2021, uh, the Keep LA House Coalition issued a report and an open letter to the Board of Supervisors um, about how um, tenant advocates felt these protections could be ramped down. Um, that also included a three-phase plan that appears to have um, been the main inspiration for the county's plan. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so the protections that are currently in place are um, mostly in place through the end of 2022. This is obviously a huge improvement from a, a monthly or a bi-monthly extension because um, tenants can be certain that these protections will be there through the end of the year. Um, in Los Angeles, we've also been very careful to not call these protections a moratorium um, because they don't stop eviction lawsuits from being filed. Instead, most of these protections provide tenants affirmative defenses if they're in a lawsuit, um, but then they still have to answer the lawsuit um, and, you know, for the most part, need representation. Um, this has really been paired with a uh, the, the first steps to a right to counsel program in LA County as well. So that has been really beneficial for tenants. Um, the protections that are in place um, prohibit late fees, interest, or pass-through charges from landlords to circumvent any non-payment or rent increase protections. Uh, they also have an anti-harassment component um, that provides uh, penalties of 5,000 per violation, plus an additional 5,000 if the tenant is elderly or disabled. Um, this part does need to be brought as an affirmative lawsuit and can't be raised during an eviction. Um, for rental units that are covered by the county's rent stabilization ordinance, so in those unincorporated areas, uh, rents are frozen. Uh, we have a similar rent freeze in the city of Los Angeles for those units that are already rent controlled. Uh, we can go to the next slide. 
Um, the protections, um, the bulk of the protections are removing or restricting certain grounds for eviction. Um, so in anywhere in LA County for the rest of 2022, uh, there are no evictions based on nuisance. And this protection has been interpreted by some judges to essentially only allow evictions to move forward right now um, if there's an immediate threat to the health and safety of other tenants. Um, the protections also um, prohibit evictions for unauthorized occupants or pets related to COVID-19. Um, so, you know, families who had to double up um, or, um, you know, reshuffle living arrangements during COVID are currently protected from violating any lease provisions that would prohibit additional occupants or uh, subletting. Um, there is also a protection for um, denying entry to landlord. You know, landlords have a right of entry and denying this normally would be a grounds for an at-fault eviction um, that has been stopped by these protections. Um, one of those phase two um, protections that's being lifted is uh, this protection. Um, it will, will no longer be in place starting June 1st uh, unless the denying entry is in response to a landlord's harassment. Because um, we heard numerous stories of landlords who were abusing their right of entry um, to harass tenants, especially early in the pandemic. Um, lastly, uh, in California, as in most places, good cause eviction laws are separated into you know, at-fault reasons for eviction and no-fault reasons for eviction. Um, the no-fault reasons are banned in the County of Los Angeles except for a carve out for um, owners who wanna move into their units. Um, it has a lot of restrictions and um, hoops that landlords have to jump through. Um, starting June 1st, a few of those restrictions will be lifted. Um, and those primarily are the, um, the wind down that the report recommended. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, the other component of this, um, which as I mentioned, is coming back only as of April 1st because of state law, um, is protections again in LA County for non-payment of rent. Now these protections only apply prospectively, um, so that it doesn't affect any rent that is currently in arrears. Um, tenants who are unable to pay rent for any of these months going forward um, are required to notify their landlord within seven days of the rent being due. Um, that they have a COVID-related financial impact, and if required, that the uh, that they are below the income threshold, um, they can self-certify that these are true, and they don't need to provide any proof or even explain what their COVID impact, which which type of financial impact they have. Um, tenants who invoke these protections have one year to pay any rent that is unpaid. Um, after that one year. Um, landlords can only collect that rent in a civil action um, for non for to collect the debt. They can't bring an eviction lawsuit and you know, displace the tenants for not paying that rent. Um, for April and May, this protection applies to all tenants um, starting June 1st as we move into phase two. Um, this only applies to tenants who are below 80% of the area median income in Los Angeles County, um, though in Los Angeles County, the, the area median income is pretty high and 80% AMI for a single person is about two times the minimum wage. Um, so looking ahead to what is what we see next on the horizon, uh, it's likely that the county will vote on the phase three protections. Um, phase three, as they drafted it, is a very large drop off in protections. It removes everything but the non-payment of rent protections for low-income tenants. Um, so we're hopeful that they will reconsider and um, do a more graduated removal of protections, um, as well as some permanent protections, for example, the um, unauthorized occupants and pets who have been you know, lawfully living in a place for almost three years at that point um, can hopefully be grandfathered in and not suddenly in violation of the lease the day these protections go away. Uh, the Board of Supervisors also called for a report um, about lessons learned from the pandemic, um, how we can improve our local tenant protections, um, both the permanent ones in the county, um, and um, how the county can use its influence to encourage permanent and hopefully consistent tenant protections across those 88 cities 
um, in LA County. And as you can imagine, it um, is kind of a patchwork of protections and um, advising tenants becomes very difficult because you need to understand kind of exactly which side of the street they live on to see which protections they have. Um, so I'll pass it back to Diane. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That was a really helpful overview of the good work that you've been doing. So thank you for sharing it and congratulations to you and, and the Keep LA Housed Coalition um, for your success. Clearly there's much more work to do, uh, but I appreciate you sharing this all today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I shared at the top of the call, some of the really high level um, next steps related to what's happening in Congress with Build Back Better, but didn't even touch on appropriations or a number of other things. So I'm going to turn it now to my colleague, Kim Johnson, who's a senior policy analyst at NLIC, to talk more about a lot of the really important details of what happens next and what you can do. So Kim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Diane, and hi, everyone. Um, so like Diane said, my name is Kim Johnson. I'm a senior policy analyst here at NLIHC, and I will be filling in for Sarah to bring you the latest updates from Capitol Hill. So we'll start out with Build Back Better. As we discussed earlier in the call, the transformative reconciliation package that was passed last year by the House is currently stalled in the Senate. The House passed bill includes over $150 billion in affordable housing and community development investments, including significant funding for the House campaign's top priorities. So that's $25 billion to expand housing vouchers, $65 billion to make critically needed repairs to public housing, and $15 billion to construct, preserve, and operate accessible and deeply affordable rental housing through the National Housing Trust Fund. Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia has been the Democratic holdout, so congressional leaders are working to find a compromise that can gain Senator Manchin's support. But it's still unclear what exactly Senator Manchin will accept. Like Diane said in her introduction, the Senate bill will likely include climate change provisions, universal pre-K and child care, but the housing provisions that we've all been fighting so hard for are still very much on the chopping block. Manchin has suggested starting over from scratch, but his Democratic colleagues are reluctant to throw out the months of negotiations that have already gone into crafting this bill. Anything that passes the Senate will likely need to be significantly scaled back from the House passed bill, so we will keep fighting to ensure that the vital investments in housing vouchers, public housing, and the National Housing Trust Fund remain in any final version of the bill. And we're calling on advocates to keep the pressure on Congress to secure these funds. Congresswoman Jayapal noted that in a private conversation, Senator Manchin expressed support for the bill's housing provisions, while Representatives Clyburn and Jeffries have publicly expressed support for maintaining those uh, important housing provisions. These public declarations of support from our congressional champions and them weighing in with congressional leadership and the White House is exactly the kind of pressure that's needed to ensure that housing makes it into any final relief package. We're asking advocates to keep contacting their members of Congress and asking them to weigh in with congressional leadership and the White House on the necessity of keeping housing investments in Build Back Better. While it's all well and good for an individual member of Congress to tell you that they support those investments, we need them to tell congressional leadership and the White House that they want significant investments for housing vouchers, public housing, and the National Housing Trust Fund included in any final reconciliation package. The timeline for enactment is still pretty unclear. Um, like uh, Congresswoman Jayapal said during her um, segment, the Congressional Progressive Caucus called on the Senate to pass their bill by March 1st, when the president is slated to give his State of the Union address. But between Build Back Better, appropriations, and the recent opportunity to, to appoint a new justice to the Supreme Court, we will need to keep pressure on Congress to pass the Build Back Better Act as quickly as possible. Like Congresswoman Jayapal said, Time is not our friend when it comes to getting Build Back Better enacted. I also wanted to take a second to touch on how the FY22 appropriations process is going. Uh, Congress was out on recess last week, but appropriations leaders in the House and Senate were still working to reach an agreement on top line funding numbers for FY 2022. Right now, there still appears to be some disagreement over those top line funding for defense and non-defense programs. Democratic appropriators would like to see a major increase to non-defense spending, while Republicans are insisting on parity between defense and non-defense appropriations bills, 
So that would essentially boil down to more money for defense and less for those non-defense programs that we all care so much about. Despite working over the recess, appropriators reportedly still have a long way to go to reach a final deal. Federal government is currently operating under a continuing resolution that will keep the federal government funded until February 18th at which point Congress will need to either enact uh, their FY22 appropriations bills, pass another continuing resolution, or face a government shutdown. Without a deal on top line funding, it is likely that Congress will pass another continuing resolution to extend government funding for at least another week to buy themselves more time to finish their FY22 appropriations work. There also remains lingering threats of a full year continuing resolution, which would lock in FY21 funding for another fiscal year. Long-term continuing resolutions can have disastrous consequences for affordable housing programs. Because the cost of housing rises every year, um, affordable housing appropriations need to increase from year to year just to keep up with the cost of um, currently appropriated assistance. Like I mentioned earlier, between appropriations, Build Back Better, and the new Supreme Court nominee, Congress, and particularly the Senate, has a full plate of work ahead, and the possibility of these timelines slipping is high. That's why we need advocates to keep weighing in with their members of Congress, not only on Build Back Better, but on the necessity of Congress enacting an FY22 appropriations bill with the highest possible funding for affordable housing. We're also asking Congress to include a proposal that would that, that was in the House um, Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill to expand housing vouchers to an additional 125,000 households. Um, I believe my colleague Elena has been posting chat, posting links in the chats for um, advocates to take action. Um, and that is about up it for my update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks so much, Kim. We don't have any specific questions right now, but I appreciate the overview and the details. Thank you. And I think maybe there's um, no questions because we got it through loud and clear throughout the call. We've said in multiple ways, and you've heard from multiple people, um, just how important this moment is and just how critical it is that you keep reaching out to your member of Congress. Our advocacy is working. There's no doubt about it. We are closer than we've ever been to this level of transformational housing investments that would make a tremendous difference in the lives of people with the lowest income and the most marginalized people. So please keep it up. Keep reaching out to your member of Congress, even if your member of Congress has already told you that they're on it and they're on your side, stay in close touch with them. Ask them what specifically they're doing to weigh in with leadership and with the White House to ensure that these critical housing investments remain in a newly negotiated bill and are enacted this year. So thank you for all of your incredible uh, advocacy. Please keep it up. Thanks for joining today's call. Take care and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.